I'm absolutely delighted now um, to welcome our speaker, Dublin City Council historian in residence, Cormac Moore, um, 100 years to the day of the signing of the treaty. Um, Cormac has published widely on Irish history, um, including the books The Irish Soccer Split and Birth of the Border, The Impact of Partition in Ireland. And in this evening's talk, the 1921 Anglo-Irish Treaty, uh, Cormac is going to look at the negotiations between Sinn Féin and the British government, um, which culminated in the signing of the treaty um, in the early hours of December the 6th, 1921. And he's going to analyze the main issues negotiated and the fallout from the signing of the treaty. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Cormac. And I hope you all enjoy the talk and I'll come in at the end um, for the Q&A. Thanks very much. Thank you, Peter, um, and for the introduction. And just to, to echo what Peter was saying, it, it would be greatly appreciated if you did uh, just have your uh, mics muted for the duration of my talk. I'm happy to take questions at the end. Either uh, you can ask a question yourself, unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can uh, put questions through the chat box and we'll get through them uh, once the, the talk is over. So I'm gonna share my screen now and you should be able to see um, uh, my PowerPoint presentation. If you can't, just uh, you know, put, put a, a, a note in the uh, chat box, uh, but you should be able to do so. So today, as, as Peter said, is, is actually the 100th anniversary of the signing of the treaty, a very significant day. I was actually just watching uh, 6 One News uh, where Dave McCullough was over in Downing Street and he was talking to Sean Wheeling and, uh, and said that uh, the British aren't uh, showing anything to do with the treaty at all. It's not a dicky bar, I think, what Dave McCullough said, um, which just shows, uh, you know, with the, in some ways, the relationships between Ireland and, and Britain. Um, but obviously, it's, for, for the Irish, it was a very, very significant event. So the Anglo-Irish Treaty, signed in the early hours of the morning of 6th of December 1921, 100 years ago today, is one of the most controversial events in modern Irish history. Today I'll be looking back at the treaty, the preliminary negotiations after the truce of July 1921, the treaty negotiations themselves from October to December 1921, and the initial fallout from the signing of the treaty, which ultimately led to the civil war the following year. Once the truce came into force on 11th of July, negotiations for a settlement began almost immediately between Sinn Féin and the British government. Four meetings were held between the Sinn Féin president, Eamon de Valera, and the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, in London, with the first one taking place on 14th of July, three days after the truce came into effect. There were huge expectations for the negotiations, with large crowds gathering outside Down Downing Street with people singing, cheering, and reciting the rosary. The British press paid much attention to De Valera at the time, as well as to his wife, Sinead. And here is the, uh, the Irish delegation en route to London. The press talked of the enthusiasm on which De Valera was received in London, including being met by London Collins. There's, there's someone that's not muted there. If you just uh... And here are some um, images of Art, De Valera, Arthur Griffith. Sorry, but, um, actually, there, there are some images of Arthur Griffith and uh, uh, Count Plunkett and uh, De Valera arrival in London. And here's the actual delegation and sitting together in, in July of that year. Even Lloyd George, veteran of so many international conferences, was not immune to the excitement surrounding the meetings. His secretary come mistress, Francis Stevenson, had never seen him so excited as he was before de Valera arrived at 4.30 p.m. on 14th of July. He kept walking in and out of my room, and I could see he was working out the best way of dealing with Dev. He had a big map of the, um, big map of the British Empire hung up on the wall in the cabinet room, with its great blotches of red all over it. This was to impress upon Dev the greatness of the British Empire and the King. Lloyd George wasn't pleased with the outcome of the first meeting though, saying De Valera was very difficult to keep to, up to the point. He kept on going off at a tangent and talking in formulas and refusing to face facts. Tough negotiations were held between the two men. Lloyd George was a man of exceptional cunning and skill who tried to play De Valera along as best he could. 
He offered de Valera a dominion status for Southern Ireland with all sorts of important powers, but no navy, no hostile tariffs, and no coercion of Ulster. It was also hoped that the Irish would contribute to war debt. Never had such a deal been offered before. Dominion status was not something fixed, solid, or frozen. It was fluid and mobile. Dominions were becoming fully-fledged nations. All signed the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. There were increasing degrees of independence for all dominions. Agreement wasn't reached, though, due mainly to Ulster. The leading Conservative, Andrew Boner Law, who was recovering from a prolonged illness at the time, believed that the biggest problem was, as always in the past, to be Ulster. I greatly fear that de Valera will find it impossible to treat Ulster as entirely outside his sphere. Boner Law, who had played such a prominent role in Ulster Unionism's, Unionism's resistance to being included in a Dublin Parliament during the Third Home Rule Crisis, feared that Lloyd George might force the Unionists into a Dublin Parliament. And here is uh, Boner Law speaking in support of Ulster Unionists at Blenheim Palace during the Third Home Rule Crisis. This is exactly what Lloyd George attempted in July. The Northern Ireland Prime Minister, James Craig, was not involved in talks between de Valera and Lloyd George following the truce in July. He informed Alfred Cope, Assistant Under Secretary in Dublin Castle, I'm going to sit on Ulster like a rock. We are content with what we have got. Let the Prime Minister and Sinn Féin settle this, and if possible, possible, leave us out. He wanted to make Northern Ireland a new impregnable pale. Here is a cartoon of Craig from the, the Bystander news, a newspaper claiming what we have, we hold. Craig believed that no coercion of Ulster was among Lloyd George's non-negotiable commitments. On 18th of July, however, Lloyd George put forward five suggestions to Craig and his ministers as to how they might accommodate de Valera's requirement of Irish unity with local autonomy for the North devolved from Dublin. The concerted efforts of Lloyd George, Conservative leader Austin Chamberlain, South African leader Jan Smuts, and Alfred Cope to budge Craig were all in vain. When Craig and his colleagues emphatically rejected their suggestions, Lloyd George backed down. Craig also set about sealing the Conservative Party support at a series of meetings with most of the Unionist leaders, including Austin Chamberlain, Lord Birkenhead, and Lord Salisbury, who promised to stand by Ulster. The makeup of Lloyd George's government determined in many ways his approach to the negotiations with de Valera and the subsequent ones with the Sinn Féin delegation from October to December, led by Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins. After the 1918 general election, Lloyd George's national coalition was easily re-elected. Most of the seats in the coalition were won by the Conservatives, though, 339 to 136 seats for Lloyd George's coalition Liberals. By 1921, Lloyd George was sensitive to his own vulnerability in the House and felt himself on occasion to be a prisoner of the coalition. Although the commitment to Ulster was waning by 1921, Conservatives still stuck to the viewpoint that there must be no coercion of Ulster into an all-Ireland parliament. Boner Law's message to Lloyd George was give what you must to Dublin, but hands off Belfast. De Valera rejected Lloyd George's proposals on 2nd of August. The British Prime Minister told King George V it was a pretty hopeless meeting. De Valera demanded dominion status with Ulster, with Ulster to become part of the Irish Dominion. Failing this, he demanded complete independence for Southern Ireland. De Valera was adamant that we cannot admit the right of the British government to mutilate our country, either in its own interest or at the call of any section of our population. Lloyd George replied that if that represented de Valera's last word, there was nothing left to discuss, except when the truce should end. But it was agreed that the truce should continue while de Valera returned to Dublin to prepare counter-proposals. And picture is de Valera arriving back in Dublin. The British tried to persuade Sinn Féin by accepting that the Northern Ireland government could not be persuaded to accept an All-Ireland Parliament, to which Sinn Féin member Arthur Bryan replied that England made this difficulty, they should deal with it. When de Valera sent a letter on 12th of August, practically refusing the British terms, Lloyd George, who was in Paris at the time, immediately returned to London. Despite the constraints his reliance on the Conservative Party posed for him, Lloyd George was, as leader Lord Beaverbrook nicknamed him, the big beast of the British government, 
the only one with the gravitas to deliver a solution. None of his cabinet had his single-mindedness or negotiating flair. According to AGP Taylor, Lloyd George on the hunt for success had to handle every problem himself. Peace abroad, reconstruction at home, Ireland, the empire. And here's a cartoon from the bystander showing, showing three Lloyd Georges dealing with the burdens of the unemployed, Gandhi and Ireland. The ape-like figure representing Ireland was commonly used by British cartoonists at the time. Lloyd George described de Valera's document rejecting the British terms as a silly answer. The British didn't have to decide if de Valera's document was an outright rejection of Dominion status or whether it was a rather a clumsy attempt to keep negotiations going. According to the Viceroy of Ireland, Lord Fitzalan, it had been a close run thing for the Cabinet of taking de Valera's letter as a refusal to negotiate, with a Cabinet committee established on 17th of August to review the military options in the event of Dáil Éireann rejecting the British terms. Lloyd George then embarked on a strange holiday in Flowerdale House, Gairlock in Scotland, where there was only one office, no telephone, a post office a mile away, only one car available, and the nearest railway station 30 miles away. He called a cabinet meeting to respond to De Valera's next message on 7th of September at Inverness Town Hall, 50 miles away. Being hauled to a far-flung corner of Scotland did not impress the cabinet nor advisers. The Chamberlain remarking, I simply spluttered with rage. At a cabinet meeting in Inverness, in proposing a conference with Sinn Féin, Lloyd George did not want it to become entangled in the Ulster problem, that De Valera would raise the question of Fermanagh and... <coughs> Sorry, there's someone there on, on mute. Do you... Someone mute themselves, please. Lloyd George did not want it to become entangled in the Ulster problem, that De Valera would raise the question of Fermanagh and Tyrone, where we had a very weak case. The conference might break on that point, a very bad one. He would rather break, if there was to be a break, now on allegiance and empire. The British responded to de Valera by asking him to enter into a conference to ascertain how the association of Ireland with the community of nations known as the British Empire can best be reconciled with Irish national aspirations. When the members of the Dáil cabinet met on 9th of September, they agreed to attend a conference and also appointed their negotiating team. This was ratified by Dáil Éireann on 14th of September. And here is De Valera speaking in the doll. However, De Valera went beyond simply accepting Lloyd George's invitation. He asserted that the Irish nation has formally declared its independence and recognises itself as a sovereign state and were entering into negotiations only as the representatives of that state. This resulted in heated exchanges between London and Dublin, whereby a fresh invitation was sent to De Valera on 29th of September to a conference starting in London on 11th of October, which De Valera with de Valera accepting the invitation the next day. One of the best known facts in Irish history is that de Valera did not go himself. It could be claimed that presidents don't negotiate with prime ministers. The recent example of the US president Woodrow Wilson, innocent and naive, being tricked by Lloyd George and George Clemenceau in Paris was fresh in people's minds. In nominating the plenipotentiaries to the Dáil on the 14th of September, de Valera stated he thought it wisest he should not be a member of the delegation. In order to emphasize in these negotiations, they were not entering as a political party, but as a nation. He was also the only leader who had met Lloyd George, who had a deserved reputation for cunning and cleverness. The Anglo-Irish Treaty would be Lloyd George's masterpiece, even by his standards. When the Minister for Local Government, W.T. Cosgrave, maintained that de Valera should be one of the delegates, de Valera replied, but that the head of state and the symbol of the Republic should be kept untouched, and that was why he asked to be left out. Most at that dawn meeting backed de Valera's stance, including Cosgrave's ministerial assistant, Kevin O'Higgins, who said he was fully convinced the president should not go. It was a matter of tactics. De Valera believed it was best to let Arthur Griffiths, the moderate, to head the negotiations. Michael Collins would provide some backbone. It would be easier to say the British were unreasonable if the talks broke down, if even the Griffiths couldn't agree with the British. De Valera would be able to control the more extreme elements in Ireland, and also the delegation could not make a decision without doubt the agreement of the cabinet. His decision to stay at home was generally accepted in Ireland, and it did not become a serious issue 
until after the treaty was signed. De Valera's critics say he was afraid of Lloyd George. He was afraid of his skill, his duplicity, his cunning. He need, needed to put the whole of England, Wales and the sea between the two of them. He didn't want to be caught in the spider's web. He also believed the negotiations would fail. A republic was never on the cards. He didn't want to be involved in what was likely to be a failure. Cosgrave said they were leaving their ablest player in reserve. Collins was seen as an extremist. He didn't want to go, but was forced to do so by De Valera. In the Dáil meeting of 14th of September, he said he believed the president, De Valera, should have been part of the delegation. He didn't, did not want to go himself, and he would very much prefer not to be chosen. De Valera replied, if he were not the symbol, he would go. He felt it absolutely necessary that the Minister for Finance, Collins, should be a member. It was from the personal touch and contact he had with his mind that he felt and he knew the Minister for Finance was a man for that team. He was absolutely vital to the de delegation. Collins believed they were set up to negotiate a compromise that de Valera himself did not wish to make. The notion, though, of Collins as a simple soldier, unused to or unable to grasp the art of negotiations, is not credible. In the end, the Irish delegation was Arthur Griffith, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Michael Collins, Minister for Finance, Robert Barton, Minister for Economic Affairs, Eamon Duggan, Dáil Deputy for Loud and Mead, and a negotiator of the truce arrangements, and George Gavin Duffy, a lawyer and the Dáil's envoy at Rome. As it turned out, Griffith, Collins and Duggan were moderates, opposed to him were Barton and Gavin Duffy, as well as a non-voting member of the delegation, Erskine Childers. The heavyweights in the delegation were Griffith and Collins. The Republican faction dominated the cabinet at home. The moderate faction dominated the delegation in London. There was ambiguity on what the term plenipotentiary meant. De Valera, unlike practically everyone else, believed the decisions had to be ratified by the cabinet. Although there was some confusion, there was an unwritten rule that he would refer back to the Irish cabinet before reaching a, any major decision. According to historian Ronan Fanning, Due to the de Valera failing to adequately to explain his reasoning to the plenipotentiaries before the talks began, the result was that it never occurred to de Valera that the ultimate decision about an agreement might be made in London and not in Dublin. Pitted against the Sinn Féin plenipotentiaries was the six-strong British negotiating team. Led, led by the big beast, the Prime Minister David Lloyd George, it also included Winston Churchill, the Colonial Secretary, Lord Birkenhead, the Lord Chancellor, Austin Chamberlain, leader of the House of Commons, Lamming Worthington Evans, the War Secretary, and Hammer Greenwood, the Chief Secretary for Ireland, three Conservatives and three Liberals. The Attorney General, Gordon Hewart, also attended for constitutional questions. The makeup of the British negotiation team suited Lloyd George, as many of the diehards within the Conservative Party were absent. Boner Law was absent due to illness. Walter Long, For a second, no, Walter Long, um, who had delivered the Government of Ireland Act, had retired earlier in 1921, and Arthur Balfour who was, was sent away for the final phases of the negotiations by Lloyd George to a naval conference in Washington from November 1921 to February 1922, the most intransigent unionists who might wreck a settlement. Even though they were considered diehards, Churchill and Birkenhead were included because they were too dangerous to leave out, it was felt. The Sinn Féin plenipotentiaries had a number of disadvantages over the British delegation. Chief amongst them was the vast experience of the British parliamentarians over the Sinn Féin negotiators. People like Lloyd George, Churchill and Birkenhead were accustomed to stringent debate and opposition in Westminster, unlike the Irish delegates, who were part of what was essentially a talking shop, the Dáil. They had honed their negotiating skills at national and international level over decades. Revolutionaries on the run, such as Collins, or imprisoned, as was Griffith, had no remotely comparable experience. The Dáil, the Dáil had only ever met on 30 occasions, from January 1919 up to the treaty negotiations in October 1921. Meetings were short and poorly attended, due to the imprisonment of many deputies and fears of further arrests by British forces. Lloyd George claimed the Irish delegates are simple. They have none of the skill of the old the nationalists. These men are not accustomed to finessing. Most of the British parliamentarians had no respect for the Irish, with Boner Law declaring the Irish were an inferior race. 
The British had also done their homework on the Irish delegation. Through Dublin Castle and the Viceroy Lord Fitzalan, the British negotiating team was told that Griffith's attitude to Ulster was that he would work to get in the whole of Ireland. Failing this, he would work for the 28 counties, but it, that he was not going to fight if he could retain the 26. Fitzalan also said, remember, they are plenipotentiaries and must not take advantage of de Valera's absence to delay and refer back to him. Whilst the British negotiators and Lloyd George in particular had painstakingly evolved and developed a coherent negotiating policy with clearly defined boundaries, the Irish delegates arrived at Downing Street with no detailed alternatives to Lloyd George's July proposals. Their, their, actual, their proposals on Ulster didn't, didn't uh, arrive from Dublin until the 14th of October, three days after the conference began. The arrival of the, the Irish delegation at 10 Downing Street at 11 a.m. on 11th of October 1921 was a truly historic day, marking the most dramatic shift in the British government's Irish policy since the Act of the Union of 1801. Huge crowds swelled the surrounding areas to pray, to cheer, and catch a glimpse of the historic proceedings. And here are some images of that the crowds you can see. And the delegations are arriving in their Rolls Royce cars. And here are some uh, um, images of the Irish delegation, um, including the, the delegation secretaries, Ellie Lyons, Alice Lyons, and Cathy McKenna. And here are some of the uh, images of the delegation arriving at Downing Street. The sig significance of the day was not lost on Lloyd George, who declared, this is the first time we have had the physical force party around the table in direct discussion. Whilst members of the Irish delegation were dependent on this conference for their actual survival, Lloyd George and the other British delegates were dependent on this conference for their political survival. What mattered to them, to them was a settlement, not its details. Here's a great uh, illustration of both delegations in session. The British were handed an immediate advantage by the failure of the Irish delegation to present an alternative position paper, resulting in Lloyd George's cabinet secretary, Tom Jones, circulating copies of the British proposals from July. According to Nicholas Mansour, however much amended, the basic paper at any conference is apt to determine the parameters of subsequent discussion. This was to prove no exception. The opening sessions focus on less contentious issues, such as air facilities, the constitutional position of dom dominions in relation to war and defence, and a free trade area between Britain and Ireland. The three main issues discussed during the negotiations were Ulster, the Crown, and the surprisingly minor one of military and naval bases. Britain had strategic defensive interests that the Irish recognised and was quickly agreed that certain ports would be controlled by the Royal Navy. Erskine Childers was the main member of the Irish delegation, unhappy with that decision. He believed cooperation with Britain on vital matters such as peace, war and defence was a grave step when the most powerful state of this group is our close neighbour and circular enemy and oppressor. Were the talks to fail, the British were determined that the break should come on the issue of sovereignty, while the Irish were intent that it should be on Ulster. The Irish were successful in reopening the Ulster question, rekindling matters that Ulster unionists thought were settled. Lloyd George admitted they had a weaker case on Ulster, stating, while British soldiers might die for the throne and empire, I do not know who will die for Tyrone and Fermanagh. Mm. The Irish delegation began with the position that the unimpaired unity of Ireland is a condition precedent to the conclusion of a treaty of association between Ireland and the nations of the British Commonwealth. The Sinn Féin negotiators offered unionists the option of joining with the South or of maintaining local autonomy over an area to be determined by plebiscite, sub subject to overriding authority from Dublin. Once the Irish delegation stated that their allegiance to Crown and Empire was contingent on Ireland's central unity, Lloyd George and the others within the British government appeared open to changing Northern Ireland status if Sinn Féin would accept allegiance to the Crown. Lloyd George told Craig in November that two dominions in Ireland was impractical and indefensible. He decried the idea of a partition that would involve cutting the natural circuits of commercial activity and said that when such frontiers are established, they harden into permanence. Lloyd George unsuccessfully tried to squeeze Craig into accepting an All-Ireland Parliament. Craig did not budge. He refused to concede any ground to Lloyd George and instead won a major victory from the British Prime Minister. 
On 5th of November, Lloyd George agreed to transfer services to Northern Ireland without the existence of a government in the South. The services had been withheld by the British, partly as a tactic in negotiations with Sinn Féin. That Lloyd George, the wily negotiator, would grant rather than receive concessions from Craig, suggests his commitment to an all-Ireland solution was not wholly sincere. The Irish delegation were aware that the Northern jurisdiction was not fully functioning when the conference began in October. Services being withheld by the British demonstrated that partition could be negotiable, but they appeared unaware on how to use this to their advantage. The significance of services being transferred to the North seemed lost on almost all back in Dublin too. With the avenue of reaching a settlement by pressurising Craig now closed, Lloyd George looked to squeeze the Sinn Féin delegation instead. His secretary, Tom Jones, dangled the idea of a boundary commission to Griffith and Collins. Collins was against the proposal as it sacrificed unity entirely. Griffith, however, was not alarmed and agreed to the establishment of a boundary commission. The treaty's main provision relating to Ulster was Article 12. It stipulated that if Northern Ireland opted not to join the Irish Free State, as was as is right under the treaty, a boundary commission would determine the border in accordance with the wishes of the inhabitants, as far as may be compatible with economic and geographic conditions. Central to the problem with the boundary commission was its ambiguity. No timetable was mentioned or method outlined to ascertain these wishes. How exactly economic and geographic conditions would relate to popular opinion and which would prove most important. No plebiscite was asked for. The clause was open to a number of different interpretations and no time was specified for the convening of the commission. The ambiguity suited Lloyd George perfectly. On the one hand, he could give the impression to Sinn Féin that large tracts of Northern Ireland would be transferred to the South. And on the other to Craig, that it would just rationalise the cumbersome border, with perhaps the inclusion of Protestant strongholds to the North. The Sinn Féin delegation clearly blundered greatly in acceding to such a vague and indefinable clause. Whilst the claim by many historians that the Irish delegates hardly focused on Ulster and were far more concerned about the issue of sovereignty is incorrect, sovereignty was a crucial part of negotiations too. The Irish were determined to gain a status as far away from the crown as possible. The Irish never looked for a republic. They sought a status known as external association instead, which was unacceptable to the British. The concept of external association drawn up by de Valera would see Ireland become a sovereign state associated with the British Commonwealth, where the British King would be head of the association, but not head of the state of Ireland. When the Irish delegation proposed that Ireland will agree to be associated with the British Commonwealth for all purposes of common concern, including defence, peace and war, and political treaties, and to recognise the British Crown as head of the association, Lloyd George privately said to Tom Jones and Francis Stevens, this means war. Others on the British side didn't think it was the last word, and it would be a bad ground for a break. The British insisted they would put any phrase the Irish wanted into the treaty to ensure that the function of the Crown in Ireland should be no more in practice than it is in Canada or any dominion. Now, George proposed on 29th of November that Ireland have the same national status as the Dominion of Canada and be known as the Irish Free State. The draft treaty was then delivered to Griffith on the evening of the 30th of November, who, after receiving some further financial amendments, travelled with the rest of the Irish delegation to Ireland for a meeting of the Dáil Cabinet on Saturday, 3rd of December. Collins, Gavin Duffy and Childers had to endure a frightening experience on the journey back to Ireland, as their boat hit another boat where three crew members lost their lives. Exhausted when they arrived at the mansion house, the resulting meeting was fractious and inconclusive, being cut short as they had to leave for London again that evening. The Dáil cabinet and the five delegates were split. Griffith and Duggan argued for acceptance. Collins was in substantial agreement as the non-acceptance of a treaty would be a gamble as England could arrange war in Ireland in a week. While Barton and Gavin Duffy were against, with the former saying England's last word had not been reached and that she could not declare war on question of allegiance. There was no consensus that the oath of allegiance could not be accepted in its present form and would need to be amended. De Valera's suggested amendment was, I, Emma de Valera, do solemnly swear true faith and allegiance to the constitution of the Irish Free State, to the Treaty of Association, and to recognise the King of Great Britain as head of the Associated States. He refused again to head the delegation as the negotiations reached their end game. 
Back in London, the British delegation rejected De Valera's counter-proposals on Sunday, 4th of December, as they were a refusal to enter the empire and accept the common bond of the crown. It looked like the discussions were over, with a plan to inform Craig the next day that the negotiations were broken down. However, Tom Jones met with Griffith at midnight and then on the night of the 4th or 5th of December. An emotional Griffith told Jones that he and Collins were won over by Lloyd George on the need for peace, but her colleagues in Dublin were not. Griffith wanted Lloyd George to get from Craig a conditional recognition, however shadowy, of Irish national unity in return for the acceptance of the empire by Sinn Féin. Collins didn't met Lloyd George alone on 5th of December, where Collins said he was dissatisfied, dissatisfied with the terms on Ulster. He wanted a definite reply from Craig and was as agreeable to a reply rejecting as acceptance, because rejection would mean that, through the establishment of a boundary commission, they would save Tyrone and Fermanagh, parts of Derry, Armagh and Down. With Collins expressing little interest in changes due to the proposed constitutional status of the Irish Free State, Lloyd George assumed that Collins, as well as Griffith, would not break on the issue of empire. It appeared to Lloyd George that Collins was satisfied the establishment of a boundary commission would lead to the unity of Ireland. As the negotiations reached their conclusion, a theatrical performance from Lloyd George on the evening of 5th of December was decisive. He reminded Griffith that he had agreed to the Ulster Boundary Commission clause with Tom Jones on 12th of November and produced a memorandum to that effect. Knowing that Griffith coveted fiscal autonomy, Lloyd George suddenly abandoned free trade, promising to agree provisionally that there should be freedom on both sides to impose tariffs in either light. This would in result in the Irish Free State imposing customs barriers along the land border between it and Northern Ireland in 1923, a move that in many ways cemented partition. Griffith then agreed that he had personally would sign the treaty, whether Craig accepted or not. According to Fanning, for the head of the delegation in a two-party negotiation, suddenly to, to announce during the negotiations that he intends to sign the document on the negotiation because his honour was allegedly impugned regardless of whether the other members of his delegation did so, was as vain as it was naive. Griffith's personal pledge to sign the treaty meant that he was effectively siding with Lloyd George and forcing his colleagues to choose between disappointing him or breaking their pledge to de Valera. The final coup de grace from Lloyd George came when he produced two letters. The first was a covering letter to go with the treaty, stating that the Irish delegates were recommending its acceptance by Dáil Éireann. The second letter said the, go the negotiations had collapsed and he had no proposal to send to Craig. Lloyd George threatened immediate and terrible war within three days and demanded acceptance of or rejection of the treaty by 10 p.m. that evening, as a special train and destroyer were ready to carry one letter or the other to Belfast. And here is a Geoffrey H. Shakespeare on the right journeying to Belfast to deliver Craig that letter, whichever letter it was, from the Prime Minister. Lloyd George's tactics worked and at 2.20 a.m. on the morning of the 6th of December, without referring back to the Irish cabinet as agreed, the Irish delegation signed the Anglo-Irish Treaty. The British civil servant Lionel Curtis described Lloyd George's negotiating with the Irish as like Augustus John drawing, every stroke was made with precision and mastery, never needed correction. Tom Jones summarised Lloyd George's achievement in essentials, we have given nothing that was not in the July proposals. It was not, this was not entirely true, as there were some key differences between what was on offer in July and what was agreed on in December. Firstly, the inclusion of a boundary commission under Article 12 of the treaty suggested that Northern Ireland's status, at least parts of it, were under threat. It led to over-optimism from nationalists, north and south, both pro and anti-treaty, and it led to increased paranoia and insecurity for unionists, particularly along the border areas. On top of being offered full dominion status, the controversial oath Irish members of parliament had to take was not the full-blooded oath which members in other dominions had to swear. While the general commonwealth oath was, I do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to his majesty King George V, with the words, so help me God, sometimes added at the end, the OTDs were asked to take was, I, you solemnly swear true faith and allegiance to the constitution of the Irish Free State, as by law established, and th that I will be faithful to His Majesty King George V, his heirs and successors by law, in virtue of the common citizenship of Ireland with Great Britain, 
and her adherence to and membership of the group of nations forming the British Commonwealth of Nations. Full economic independence with the ability to raise tariffs on British goods was also agreed. Although it wasn't the deal anyone wanted, it was immediately welcomed in Ireland. Most people wanted peace. The establishment of the Catholic Church, the media, businesses and the middle class were massively in favour of the treaty. As a gesture of goodwill, the British released 4,000 internees. Eamon de Valera was furious though, and here he is reviewing IRA troops at Six Mile Bridge in Clare at the time the treaty was signed. He felt disillusioned and deceived. He wanted to immediately dismiss the cabinet members who signed the treaty, Collins, Griffith and Barton. He was dissuaded to do so by another cabinet member, W.T. Cosgrave, who asked for the delegates to be allowed to explain themselves. Some Republicans had sought for the delegates to be arrested upon their return from London. Bitter cabinet discussions followed. Eventually, the treaty was narrowly endorsed by the cabinet. Collins, Griffith, Barton and Cosgrave voted for it. De Valera, Cahill Brewer and Austin Stack voted against it. Dáil Éireann convened in New City in Earlsford Terrace to debate the treaty. The debates lasted for 15 days. Nobody defended the treaty as an ideal settlement. There was no mention of recognition of a republic before the negotiations commenced. Acceptance of the invitation to negotiate was in essence relinquishing the republic according to Collins. They lost the Republic of Ireland in order to save the people of Ireland. Griffith commented that by half recognising the empire, they could hold their heads up, to which someone heckled, you mean with your hands up. The difference of faith versus allegiance, obedience to the crown was also argued. One commented that when a man gets married, he promises to be faithful, not to be obedient, to which another heckler remarked, wait until you get married. <laughs> Opponents of the treaty, above all, rejected the oath. They also argued that the delegates had no right to sign the treaty without referring back to Dublin. Mary McSweeney, sister of Terence, who had died on hunger strike a year earlier, commented that the king was written into the treaty and would be in the Free State Constitution. The treaty gave way the independence that was proclaimed in 1916 and thereafter. McSweeney, as well as the other five women TDs, were opposed to the treaty. And here are Margaret Pierce and Countess Markovic entering the Dáil for the treaty debates. Many believed women should take a huge portion of the blame for causing the civil war. Cosgrave called them a law unto themselves. Others called them holy terrors and certain neurotic women. They were accused of spitting and frotting to the mouth like angry cats, and that the Irish people will not be in a hurry again to elect women to represent them. While Cumann Amon as an organisation came out strongly against the treaty, there were some prominent pro-treaty women supporters, including Jenny Wise Power and Min Mulcahy. Early in the debates, De Valera introduced his alternative proposal, document number two. The main difference between it and the treaty was that no oath was to be taken. The king would only be recognised as head of the Association of Commonwealth Countries. The Freeman's Journal, in describing the subtle differences between both documents, remarked there would be war for a grammarian's formula. While supporters of the treaty ridiculed the very idea of going to war over the wording of a few sentences, it was not, this was not a purely symbolic issue. At stake were the fundamental nature of the Irish constitution, the source of government authority, the people or the king, and the relationship with Britain, equal or subordinate. On partition, there was no difference between de Valera's proposals and the treaty. With the exception of Sean McEntee and Ona Duffy, both Ulster men, Partition rarely featured as an issue. Of the 338 pages documenting the public debates on the treaty, just nine pages were devoted to Ulster. That's less than 3%. The private debates showed there was even less concern about partition, with only three out of 180 pages devoted to Ulster. The proposed Boundary Commission was accepted as a game changer by both pro and anti-treaty sides, even though the British and Unionists claimed on a number of occasions at that time there would be little, if any, change to the border. Lloyd George himself insisted in the House of Commons on the 16th of December 1921, just 10 days after the signing of the treaty, that there would be no large-scale transfer under the Boundary Commission. A break in the debates came at Christmas, with hopes it would help ease tensions. When encountering their voters, many TDs saw a clamouring for peace amongst the people. Tensions happened to raise, though, with tempers worsening instead. 
Erskine Childers was called the damned Englishman by Griffith. A vote was taken and the Dáil narrowly voted in favour of the treaty by 64 to 57 votes. There was a long silence after the vote, following which de Valera spoke before he put his head in his hand, as can be seen here, and cried, as did most TDs. One contemporary described the reaction of some of those who opposed the treaty on losing the vote. Harry Boland was crying like a child, and Crottle Brewer, Brewer was biting his lips in bitter disappointment. Childers was sitting, his face was drawn and haggard, bloodless lips were parched and twitched in painful grief. De Valera, De Valera resigned and wanted to have a vote taken on him as president. Those opposing him said it was not about him. They were not debating his presidency. The vote was taken though, and he was defeated by 60 votes to 58. De Valera went into opposition and was replaced as president of the Dáil government by Griffith. Griffith also became leader of Sinn Féin once again. De Valera, along with his supporters, then walked out of the Dáil. The seeds of the civil war were sown. So that, that concludes the talk. I'm just let you know on this Wednesday at, uh, at uh, um, 8, 8 of December at 7.30 p.m., I'll be giving an online talk. It's, it's being hosted by the Lord Mayor on that fateful Dáil cabinet meeting that voted 4-3 in favour of the treaty and um, from the drawing room, the mansion house. It, it, it's, it's available to uh, log on online. Um, and uh, that it'll, it'll be taking place from the very room that meeting took place, the drawing room at the mansion house. Um, but you can register for free on eventbrite.ie. Um, so that's, that's 7.30 this, uh, this Wednesday. So with that, I'll uh, open the floor to any questions or comments that people have. That's great, Cormac. Thanks. Um, I'm sure you'll all agree that was an excellent um, insight into the events surrounding the signing of the 1921 treaty and its aftermath. So um, I think there are some, there's, there are a couple of questions there. Um, so we can have a look at those. Yeah. And people can unmute themselves and uh, ask direct questions if they want as well. Um, there's one um, question there, Cormac. Um, is there a specific record of the delegates agreeing not to sign anything without reverting to Dublin. I know that Dev issued a series of instructions, including that provision, but understood that the delegates never agreed to that. Yeah, no, they did. No, there was a general understanding. There was a, like, the, the, the problem here is that the Dáil gave the, the uh, delegates the power as plenipotentiaries, but then the cabinet agreed that even though they were plenipotentiaries, they still had to uh, go back to the to cabinet before they made any decisions. And this all kind of came into a head in on that, that, that infamous meeting on the 3rd of December when uh, when uh, the, the, all the delegates came back from London um, for that meeting. Um, and it, it was very confusing. It was very rushed because they all had to rush back to London um, for the vote. Um, but it was agreed that look, they, they wouldn't sign anything um, if, if there was no amendments. So there's a bit of confusion here. They would not sign anything if there was no amendments um, and they refer back to the, the cabinet. Um, so there's two ways of, of taking that. That they, 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 they like Lloyd or Griffith and Collins and others felt they did get some amendments, whereas uh, De Valera felt that the amendments weren't weren't significant. That they, you know, they, they agreed to uh, sign up to the Crown, so they actually went against the word. So uh, that's where the confusion is. That 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 third of December meeting uh, um, was, was a little bit um, kind of scatterbrained and all over the place, and that's why there's a bit of confusion over. But, but on the whole, I think it's fair to say that they, it was a, there was a general understanding that they would refer back to Dublin uh, before making the major decision. And, and to be fair to, uh, be fair to, to Griffith was aware of that, he, who obviously was the main guy who, who, who uh, supported the treaty, he constantly wrote to De Valera throughout the, the, the negotiations. He, he asked for that cabinet meeting in the 3rd of December saying, look, we need agreement from the full cabinet as per instructions. Um, so, you know, it was very clear that they had to go back to the cabinet to, uh, and before major decisions were made. That's great, thanks. Um, thank you, Cormac. If the cabinet vote had gone against accepting the treaty, what would have been the next steps? Well, the, the treaty had to be signed by both uh, houses of parliament. So the British actually, they, they had to vote for the treaty as well. It wasn't, just a, it wasn't good enough just for the, the signatories to sign it and that was it. So it, it was accepted by both houses of parliament um, in, in mid-December uh, 1921. Um, so even if the cabinet had voted against it, it still would have had to go to the Dáil um, to be ratified. Th th that would have been my understanding of it. But it would have been a huge momentum shift in favour of the anti-treaty side 
if the cabinet will vote against it. Um, I, I, I'll be talking about this on uh, on uh, on Wednesday in more detail. But what, what was interesting as well, the cabinet actually structure had changed because of a decision by De Valera that August when he actually became head of the Republic. The, the cabinet was actually quite a bit uh, bigger in the first doll, but he wanted a smaller doll because he felt it was easier to get business done with a smaller doll. So he had, or sorry, smaller cabinet. So he insisted on seven ministers only. And he had eight, eight extra cabinet ministers, people who weren't at the cabinet table but had ministerial responsibility. And of those eight, five of them actually in the Dáil debates voted against the treaty and only three voted for the treaty. So if they actually had been in the cabinet, De Valera would have had an eight to seven uh, vote in, in favour against the treaty and he actually would have had a huge momentum shift. But I still, I still believe it's, it would still have to be ratified or not by the Dáil, regardless of what the cabinet decides. Thanks, Cormac. Um, there's just a comment there from Rita. She's tuning in from Florida. Um, excellent presentation and photos. Um, other good complimentary comments there. Um, there's one from Teresa. Thank you. Some of this is sounding very familiar due to Brexit. Brilliant talk. Um, and another one there. Really interesting talk. Congratulations to Cormac. Um, are there any um, plans for a further talk on the civil war that ensued. <laughs> well, as, as Cormac said, he's talking again on Wednesday night. Yeah, but I mean, like, next year, we, yeah, we, we definitely will be going into a civil yeah. war territory course. So, yeah, that, that's... Uh... Yeah, we'll, we'll talk to Cormac about, you know, further talks in the future. We'd be delighted to have him back. Um, I, lot... about, uh, I hope Barbados checked their paperwork, which is a... Uh... <laughs> um, it was very appropriate at the moment becoming a republic and yeah look it, 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 the devil came into details uh, and certainly um, um, the Irish found that out um, that the, the wording of, of treaties is absolutely vital getting it right even that whole idea of uh, what a, you know, external association means um, the devil there actually put in a one draft saying that the king would be the head of the associated states but then it actually had to be changed to the king will be head of the association of the states, so there's a big difference there. So if he's the head of the associated states, then the king is the head of the state. Whereas if he's head of the association, the British Commonwealth of those states, then he's not necessarily head of those states. So you know it can be can be very very tricky. And and, and I think I think the, that that uh, in, in some ways uh, there there was a few mistakes made along the line. Okay, thanks, Cormac. Um, I think Liam Liam would like to ask a question. He has his hand up. Thanks, Liam. Thanks very much. Hi, Cormac. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, absolutely fantastic and insightful um, talk. I was just wondering there, I suppose, you know, the, the, thinking about it over the years and obviously this evening as well, um, there was so much strife, I suppose, and so much focus caused, or, you know, we're focused around the issue of the, the oath of allegiance and membership of the, the Commonwealth and so so very little around the issue of Ulster. Was, was that just the Was that just sort of the, the, the being realistic they realized the position of Ulster had been cemented I suppose our republic 32 counties was never on the table at all and it was just about getting the best possible position for the the remaining 26 that that Ulster didn't really feature so feature so little in the in in, in the discussions and did, I suppose my second thought was why did, did, did they did they, the delegates try to get a completely separate 26 counties at any point and were the British not open to that I mean I've seen that Ulster had been I suppose you know was was settled and obviously Northern Ireland was in existence even before the truce could could a, a, a fully independent 26 counties not have occurred yeah that's a good Thank question Steve. thanks um on, on the first one um yeah there, there's definitely some uh, um something which say there about that the um, to be honest, they, they weren't sure about Ulster. Like they, they didn't have really any coherent policy in Ulster. You know, from the moment Sinn Féin became the most popular nationalist movement in Ireland, they had no coherent strategy in Ulster. And um, their, their first major strategy was the Belfast boycott, which, which was a bit of a disaster in terms of, uh, you know, psychologically creating a further partition in Ireland. Um, so they had no real clear um, 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 policy on it. Um, but you know they, they they definitely were not partitionist though. I think I think that's often been claimed, but I I do not believe that for a second. They they all along they wanted a united Ireland, um they wanted the territory counties if they could get that, and they and they, they kept on asking for essential unity. You know that's what they wanted. And it was part of that was tactics in that they wanted to fail if if, if the negotiations fell. It suited them better to fail on Ulster because the British didn't have a strong moral case on Ulster. 
particularly when it came to Fermanagh and Tyrone, which had a nationalist majorities. Um, but um, whereas the British would prefer if they fell on uh, on um, you know the, the crown and the empire, where, where they have a much better more uh, uh, argument, they fell anyway. Um, so so the, the problem with the boundary commission was, well, the boundary commission is not necessarily a bad idea because there were a lot of boundary commissions at that time, you know, after the First World War. So there was five in Europe, and that happened. The problem with this boundary commission was that they they had they, they had the the precedence of you know what the people want. The will of the people, and then you had added this contingent on geographic and economic additions. That didn't happen in other boundary commissions that happened. So, so all of a sudden you you have in vague territory, which is more important, geographic or economic additions or the will of the people. Um, also, there was no plebiscite um, given. Collins wanted a plebiscite, but it wasn't it wasn't uh, emphasized strong enough, and uh, they didn't get a plebiscite. They should have asked for a plebiscite and insisted upon it because all the other boundary commissions got plebiscites. And that would have that would have mean that the meant that uh, Tyrone and Fermanagh would in all likelihood have gone back into the, the into free state, um, and they, they also should not have agreed to the British judge being the chairperson, um, because again all of the other boundary commissions had independent chair people. So so they made a huge amount of own goals there um, in terms of the boundary commission deal. They didn't look at the details. They didn't carefully analyse it. And and it wasn't just the delegates. It was also the people um, in Dublin and, and even in the Dáil. The Dáil was rarely, rarely debated at the boundary commission. They thought it was actually. It was um, partition was temporary. It wasn't going to last. At that stage, partition wasn't really affecting people's day to day lives. It was only the imposition of customs barriers in twenty three that really became apparent to, on people's daily lives on a daily basis. So people thought it was temporary, but nature it was going to last anyway. The boundary commission would sort it, and and they, they slept walk into it. Um, partly because they didn't know much about the north, they didn't really understand the the level of hostility within Ulster unionism to being governed by Dublin. Um, and partly because the, the, the boundary commission would work. And sorry, that's a very long answer, but uh, and your final question, um, De Valera said that his first option, would he, he would go into Dominion if it was for 32 counties, but other than that, he wanted full independence for the 26 counties. He, he, that's what he asked of, of Lloyd George. Um, that, that didn't come up much in the treaty negotiations. There's no, not much evidence of that in the treaty negotiations where they, they consistently asked for the essential unity of Ireland. And, and Griffith really wanted to, um, um, the essential unity of Ireland um, uh, throughout the negotiations, that's quite clear. Lovely, lovely Cormac, thank you. No that's great, Liam, thanks, thanks, Cormac. Um, there's another question there from Colin Cormac. How credible was Lloyd George's threat of war? Yeah, that, that's a, it's a good question, it's a very fair question. I personally think it would have been a disaster for the British to go back to war in Ireland, and I think he was bluffing. Um, I, I think I think it was a good tactic by him to use that, and like it's, it's a I don't think it's unreasonable as some people call it. Like it's a very natural tactic to use. If you've got a big army, you know, you know, it's a tactic you would use. No, why, why wouldn't you use it if you could? Um, and, and obviously, if, if the truce ended, well, then it'll go back to war. So you know, it was kind of uh, pretty logical as well. Um, but would he have gone back to war? I just think that the, the public public wouldn't have stomached it. And 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 if you look at uh, Neville Macready, the, the British commander um, of, of the, uh, the 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 armor, the, the commander of the British army in Ireland. What he had said in, in around the July time, when they were talking about, you know, uh, kind of governing on a Crown Colony basis, you would have had to, you know, um, basically put all of uh, 26 counties on, ma on martial law, you'd have put to pour loads of more troops into Ireland, and they didn't have much troops there, they were overstretched as it was all around the world, around the empire, and you'd have to kill 100 men a day. How would you stomach that, Lloyd George? How would you, how would the public stomach that? I don't think, I don't think they would have gone back to war, personally. Thanks, Cormac. Um, there's another question there. Did the delegates sign the treaty because they believed the best British offer and knew Doyle Aaron would have to make the final decision? Well, it depends on which ones you talk to of the five. Um, Griffith, yes. Griffith, um, actually, Griffith had years before, you know, looked for this similar type of solution. You know, he, he in the early 1900s, he wrote that book, The Resurrection of Hungary, where he talked about a dual monarchy kind of a system like they had in Austria, Hungary since 1867, and, and he was on for that scheme. So, you know, he, he was okay with Dominion status. Um, he was big on fiscal independence, and he got that at the last minute, so he was very happy with that. Um, and he thought the Boundary Commission was a good, um, you know, it, it was it was an okay um, solution to the the, the Northern uh, um, issue. Um, so so he, he thought, on the, he recommended a treat on its merits. Um, but the, uh, and Duggan recommended that it go to Dahl, as did Collins. Collins believed 
Collins definitely definitely wasn't a, pl- a fan of the, uh, the boundary commission, and, and he proved that himself in the, the following six months. Um, but he felt actually, and he, and he was right actually in the, in the long term that the, the actual when it came to the oath and the, you know the, the, the powers of the Dominion start and Dominions, they, they were getting you know they were getting more independent as, as years went by, and that actually is what happened. So um, he, he felt it was it was uh, it was right to to recommend on that basis. But but the other two signatories, uh, Gavin Duggan and uh, uh, Barton, they they only signed it out of duress. They were pretty much felt if they don't sign this, they're going to be the cause of the war. And they, they felt that Lloyd George was serious and that it was going to be war. Um, and they were put on, their, like, if you read their accounts, it, it differs, depends on whose account you read. But I think if you read Barton's and the witness statements, he said he was put on, they were himself and, and Gavin Duffy were put under enormous pressure by by Collins, Griffith and, uh, and Duggan to sign. Um, and uh, yeah, and they, they they were told to be put up in lampposts, to be the first put up in lampposts if uh, if they were the, the, the cause of reigniting the war. Um, so they signed. Thanks, Cormac. And um, there's a question there from Kieran. He's tuning in from New York. Um, great presentation. Uh, what was the reaction to the treaty in England? Overall, um, um, it was uh, what you know accepted. It was uh, well received. The, the world, uh, this, is not, this is not uncommon as well. If, if we look from our own experience of the Good Friday Agreement, you know, when that was signed, it was just, you, you know, generally there was, there was a, the world's reaction was very positive. Same with Britain, same around the world. Um, there was something like some in the Conservative ranks weren't happy with it. They, they believed that they had surrendered to murderers. Um, and Ers- um, um, Edward Carson, um, who, was in, who was actually in the House of Lords, he was no longer the Ulster Unionist leader, he said it was a surrender to murderers and they the way they were badgering the North as well, and, and he was disgusted with the treaty. Um, but overall, the, the, the people were very positive with it, including the opposition parties of, of uh, Labour and the Liberals and so on. Thanks, Cormac. And there's another question there from Pat. On a technical point, is it correct to say that the document signed on the 6th of December 1921, it was an agreement for a treaty rather than a treaty? Yeah, no, the treaty had to be ratified afterwards by the Dolls, the Doll and the, the British Parliament. So. So yeah, this wasn't the, the treaty wasn't agreed, it wasn't signed um, at that stage. It had to be ratified by both both parliaments, which it was by uh, by January 1922. And the actual Irish Free State then obviously came into effect exactly a year after uh, the treaty was signed on the sixth of December 1922. And um, that's great, Cormac. Um, a question there from Francis: Why did the Irish side not come to London in October with their counter proposals? Um, yeah, you'd have to ask them that. <laughs> they should have they didn't do their homework i think a lot of them uh you know they weren't uh, politicians like collins for example thought it was a dirty game politics didn't want about to do with it he was a plain speaking man he didn't want to be caught in the trap of london and all of this um yeah they, they definitely went unprepared and and uh and, and plus um um de valera who was, who was the main person formulating policy he was a bit slow particularly he, he only came up with the ulster um proposals um, for the delegation you know, on the 14th of October, whereas they had already started on the 11th of October. It was a bit embarrassing for Griffith because he was going, actually, we're waiting for the, you know, we're waiting for proposals, give me a minute here, you know, give me a while here. So it, it, was, it was bad preparation, to be perfectly blunt about it. They should have had uh, uh, um, absolutely clear proposals, clear counter-proposals um, by the time the negotiation started. Great. Um... Yeah, we'll just have a look now. There's a comment there from Tom. There's a very interesting three episode podcast about the Boundary Commission on BBC on BBC Sounds, um, called "Assume Nothing Breakup." Well worth a listen. Yeah, I've never never heard of that. I'd definitely check it out. Um, a question there from Adrian: Would Dev have agreed to allegiance to the Crown if offered 32 county Dominion status? Yeah, well, yeah, so there's two bits of evidence I would suggest that he would have. First of all, he, he suggested that to Lloyd George that, um, that he would want, uh, um, if, if Ireland got Dominion status, it would have to be for the 32 counties of Ireland. Failing that, he wanted full independence for the, the 26 counties. And, and he, he actually complained in the 3rd of December cabinet meeting um, that, that that draft treaty by the British that was presented to the cabinet um, there was you no, know, didn't even give one or the other. So there was no, uh, um, um, you know, uh, external association, Irish Republic, 
nor was there a 32 county uh, dominion status. So, so, so it, it, would, it would, from just reading from that, you would say that he would have accepted 32 county dominion status um, um, instead, instead of his external association. Right. Um, I think there's a, there are a couple of questions there. Um, just a comment there from Fiona. Um, it's funny, when this was covered in school, I felt a lot more strongly about the loss of the six counties than I do now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, there's another question there about um, what discussion was there on decommissioning Irishmen who were serving in the British Army and RIC DMP at the time? Yeah, there was a there was issues around pensions and all of that, um, and uh, the, the Irish had a huge issue with uh, with having to pay for pensions for the auxiliaries and black and tans, and it was, it was agreed that that wouldn't be brought in, but that that definitely would have been a step too far. But the RAC they did they did contribute to pensions for the RAC, so it was but it was it was the the black and tans auxiliaries that was a no goal for the Irish, and and the British recognised that as well. Yeah, I think that's about it. Um, is there anybody else who'd like to come in with a question? There are a lot of um, very complimentary comments there. Thank you very much for those. Um, if anybody else wants to come in, maybe they can put their hand up. Okay. No? Okay. Listen, folks, um, I want to thank you all. Firstly, I want to uh, thank Cormac again. Um, for an excellent presentation, as usual, we're always delighted to have him here in Rohini.